I want to ask you to open your copy of the Word of God tonight to Psalm 14. We finished up our Overcome series the last time I was with you on a Wednesday evening, and all those messages are available in the app. I hope that you'll take advantage of them. Tonight, I just want to do a standalone message, one of these passages I love. In Psalm 14, I'm going to begin reading in verse 1 in just a moment. I've titled this message, it's one of my favorites, What a Fool Believes. You ever heard that song before, What a Fool Believes? Written by Michael McDonald, Kenny Loggins, I love. They have an amazing songwriting ability and a great vocal ability. It was recorded by the Doobie Brothers in August 1978, released in January of 79. Reached number one on the Billboard Hot 100 for 1479. I found out that the song won Grammy Awards in 1980 for both Song of the Year and Album of the Year. If you've ever tried to listen to the song, you know, sometimes we sing songs and we hum the tune and the melody and the chorus. And if you ever really listen to the words of the song, it tells the story of a man who is reunited with a former love interest and his attempts to rekindle a romantic relationship. But the problem is the relationship between him and this woman never really existed to begin with. That's why the song says, trying hard to recreate what had yet to be created. We'd say that would be a poor, pathetic fool, right? The song reminds us that fools have believed a lot of things, but I believe when you look at all the Word of God, nobody has done a better job than David here in Psalm 14 and giving us a look into the mind of a fool. And by the way, tonight, we don't say this with any arrogance. All of us before Christ were in this same foolish mind state, lost apart from Jesus, but by His grace, we've been brought near. Let me share with you, though, these things that David gives us here tonight. I want to go ahead and read Psalm 14, beginning at verse 1. If you're there, say amen. amen. To the chief musician, a psalm of David. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You can read those same words in Psalm 53, 1, by the way. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt, and there is none who does good, no, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great fear, for God is with the generation of the righteous." You shame the counsel of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord brings back the captivity of his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. Several things I want to say to you tonight about that. Number one, notice with me that only a fool believes that there is no God. Only a fool. He says in verse 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. When you do a little word study on the word that we translate fool in English, it translates the Hebrew word Nabal. The word is used 18 times in the Old Testament to describe somebody who is senseless or ignorant. Remember in 1 Samuel chapter 25, there was actually a man that was named Nabal. Remember that? Scripture says there was this guy named Nabal. David was on the run with his mighty men from King Saul. And while they were on the run, David and his men took unto themselves some of Nabal's shepherds and protected them and made sure that they were fed and that all their necessities were taken care of. Well, Nabal's shepherds returned back to their master, back to Nabal, and then somewhere down the line, David and his men needed some assistance. They needed some help. His men needed to be fed, and so David sent word to Nabal and said, Nabal, you remember how I took care of your shepherds several months or years ago. Now I need you to help take care of some of my men. Would you please give them of some of your provisions? And Nabal refused to do so. He was indignant. He said, absolutely not. I'm not going to give them anything that I have. And so the word came back to David, and they said, David... We talked to Nabal like you told us to talk to him, but he said he wasn't going to give anything to your men. Well, that didn't sit too well with David. He said, everybody suit up. We're going to go right out, and we're going to go take care of business. And as they were on their way probably to slaughter Nabal and his inhabitants, the Scripture says that Abigail, his wife, who was a godly woman, 
prepared a bunch of food and supplies and resources and met David and his men as they were on their way to come to battle against Nabal. And in doing so, she actually saved her husband's life and the lives of many other people as well because she was a wonderful woman of God. She actually gave advice to King David. She said, David, don't do this. Don't go to war. Don't make bloodshed. This will be a disgrace to you. She said, everybody knows that you're the anointed of God and that you're going to be the next king of Israel. You let God fight your battles. God will take care of this. And when David received that advice from that godly woman, he relented. He received her provisions. His men received the provisions, and he did not go to war against Nabal. But you know, God has an amazing way of taking care of things in his own time. You know what happened to Nabal? They came back to him. Abigail came back to him and said, because you acted so foolishly, I basically had to take care of business myself. And when Nabal found out that David was coming to actually go to war with him, the scripture says that he became like a stone and within about a week's time he was dead. God took care of that. His name was Nabal. Can you imagine naming your child Nabal when that name means foolish? Some mom did that to her child. She named her child Foolish. He refused to help David and his men, but God took care of all of that. I was looking back over a little poem I want to share with you. When we think about the foolishness of saying and believing that there is no God, and by the way, I don't think anybody genuinely in their heart of hearts really believes that. You know, the Bible says that God has been made manifest to every single one of us. Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 2, that in our heart of hearts, in our conscience, in our being, we really do know that God exists. But the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 that we suppress that truth in unrighteousness because we want to live in sin, because we want to be the captain of our own own fate. Let me read you this little poem I found. He was just a little boy on a week's first day, wandering home from Sunday school and dawdling along the way. He scuffed his shoes into the grass. He even found a caterpillar. He found a fluffy milkweed pod and blew out all the filler. A bird's nest in a tree overhead wisely placed up so high was just another wonder that caught his eager young eye. A neighbor watched his zigzag course and held him from the lawn, asked him where he'd been that day and what was going on. I've been to Sunday school, he said, and turned a piece of sod. He picked picked up a wiggly worm replying, I've learned a lot about God. Hmm, very fine way, the neighbor said for a boy to spend his time. If you tell me where God is, I'll give you a brand new dime. Quick as a flash, the answer came, nor was his voice faint. I'll give you a dollar, mister, if you can tell me where God ain't. That's a pretty good answer right there, isn't it? The scripture says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. In fact, I want to give you something here tonight. You know, when we go to, when you go to seminary, you get to take courses in Christian philosophy and ethics, theology. You know, I was told in a philosophy class there are several ways that we can put forward to people who say they don't believe in God, evidence that know that there actually is a God to whom we must give an account. A few arguments. One of them, it was a big word, but they called it the cosmological argument, cosmos. That means our earth, the world, the universe, planets, stars, everything that's included. Here's the idea. All these things we have, this universe, this world, all this stuff, do you want us to believe that everything just popped up out of nothing? Is that really what you want us to believe? You know, they do want us to believe that about 14, point, or rather 14 billion years ago, about 13.8 billion years ago, that everything just banged out out of nothing, right? They call that the Big Bang Theory. There was nothing, and then all of a sudden, there was an explosion, and everything just flung out into its current course. Doesn't that seem ridiculous? That there was nothing. And then all of a sudden, out of nothing, something just popped up. That defies everything that we've ever learned about the natural order. Everything that you see around you is finite. It has a beginning, and it has an end. But that's not the case when it comes to God. We know that God is not natural. God is supernatural. See, that's the idea, that a natural creation requires a supernatural God. 
That's what we're trying to say. Another argument they would teach us was called the teleological argument. And in other words, I've got this little Apple watch on here tonight. You know, it doesn't have us. It's not a traditional watch. It doesn't have all the springs and all that stuff. But, you know, there's a lot of intricate technology. I don't even begin to understand it. All I know is we can buy it at the store and we can put it on and it tracks our steps and stuff like that. But I really don't understand how this thing works. There's a lot of intricate technology in here probably that I will never understand. I mean, are we to be led to believe that perhaps somehow this watch came into an existence when all these little parts and pieces were just laying around? I mean, they were just laying around on a table somewhere and then somehow over the course of time, all the little hundreds and thousands of parts and pieces that went into my watch just finally came together and became this intricately technologically advanced watch. I don't believe that. Do you believe that? I believe that the existence of a watch implies the existence of a watchmaker. Don't you think that's right? But see, an evolutionist would have us to believe that everything just came to an intricately designed and orderly world and universe all by itself. Doesn't the creation imply the existence of a creator? Absolutely it does. Great philosophers like Aristotle and Socrates and Plato, they would say that God is the uncaused causer. The one who causes everything, but he himself was not caused. You ever heard the arguments for intelligent design? People say that they see intelligent design in the universe and creation. I mean, my goodness, just look at the intricacy of the human eye. Did all that just happen by accident? No, there's a God who orchestrated all of that. He is the creator of all things. And so the design that we see in the world and the universe points us to the existence of an intelligent designing creator, God. Also another argument that you can read about if you've ever read a book called Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. I highly recommend it. won't take you too long to read it. And he says in the book that when you go from culture to culture to culture, what you find is that in the Swahili or among the Aborigine, or among those throughout Europe, or even here in North America and to South America, what you're going to find is that in just about all cultures, universally, some things will probably be acceptable and right, while just about some practices in just about every culture will be universally wrong. Murder, theft, various things of that nature. Generally speaking, if you look throughout the culture, some things are universally wrong. C.S. Lewis says, where does that come from? Where does that moral compass come from? Well, the Bible answers that question. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, that God has written His law on our conscience. You and I have been made in the image of God, and with that, I believe, He has woven into us, into our very fabric of our being, His morality so that we can begin to understand, even in an unregenerate state, we can understand things about right and wrong. Of course, we come to a fullness of that knowledge when we place our faith in Jesus Christ and we grow in our understanding of the Word of God. But all that to say that when you look at creation, when you look at design, when you look at culture, it all points us to the fact that there is a God. I want to share this with you. Think about these words I'm going to read to you now. There are some popular atheists in our world. One of them is named Richard Dawkins. Without God, I'm going to say to you that life has no purpose. That's what Richard Dawkins said. Here's his quote. He says, life has no higher purpose than to perpetuate the survival of DNA. Can I say that one more time? This most prominent atheist, probably in the world, Richard Dawkins says, life has no higher purpose than to perpetuate the survival of DNA. Life has no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. If a person believes that, do you understand why they would be prone to take their own life? If I'm suffering and hurting and in distress and pain, if there's nothing else beyond the grave, why don't I just end my suffering right now? Because there is no purpose in life. That's what the prominent atheists believe. They also believe that life has no meaning. They say, William Province says, there are no gods, no purposes, no goal-directed forces of any kind. 
There is no life after death. There is no ultimate foundation for ethics. Can you believe that? No ultimate meaning in life and no free will for human beings. He's saying that we don't even have a foundation upon which we can rest our morality. In other words, what he's saying is, whatever you want to be right can be right. And whatever you want to be wrong can be wrong. Wouldn't it be sad to actually believe those words that came out of the mouths of those fools? The Bible says that they are fools because they say in their heart that there is no God when clearly the creation, the scripture, everything in the world testifies to us that there is a God. We know that His name is Jehovah. Now then, number two, let me say to you tonight that a fool not only believes that there is no God, but a fool also believes that I'm okay and you're okay. You saw verses one through three right there. The Apostle Paul uses these same verses in Romans chapter 3. He says, there's none who does good, no, not one. In these verses and in Romans where Paul puts this argument together in great detail, we call this theologically the total depravity of man. I am so depraved, what that means is I have been separated from God. And in me, there is no good thing. The only good thing that I can aspire to be, that I can have ultimately is my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when He comes inside and regenerates me, He changes me from the inside out and then I can truly walk in the goodness of God and live in according to gospel truth and according to biblical truth. But outside, but outside of that, I'm hopeless. I'm in despair because left to myself, I am depraved. I am wicked. You ever heard people before say, just trust your heart? That's bad advice. Bad advice. You know what the Bible says about the human heart? It's desperately wicked. Who can understand it? You know a lot of people base their life and make their decisions based on the way they feel? That is terrible, terrible way to make decisions. The very best way to make decisions is according to the inerrant Word of God and by the direction of the Holy Spirit. I was just sharing in a devotion that I filmed with my brother Max who was in here this morning, I was recounting in that story, you know, great men and women of God in the Bible. One of those was Joshua. We get this story in Joshua chapter 9, up into chapter 9. It's like Joshua is a man who can do no wrong. They go and they, they cross the Jordan River on dry ground. They set up memorial stones. He has an encounter with I, whom I believe is uh, Jesus in his pre-incarnate state. Jesus, I believe in the Old Testament, the Bible calls him the commander of the Lord's army at the end of Joshua chapter 5. You get to Joshua chapter 6, the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. They have one military conquest after another. But then you get to Joshua chapter 9. I, think, I can't remember if it's the Gibeonites or which people it is, but they send a delegation of people to Joshua, but they disguise themselves. And in disi disguising themselves, they were able to deceive Joshua and the leaders of Israel, and they entered into a treaty with this group of people, and then after the treaty was forged and signed and sealed, then they revealed their true identity. But up until that point, God had told Joshua, you are to remove all of the people of the land. But then they entered into a treaty to go exactly against what God told them to do. And here's what the Bible says in Joshua chapter 9, verse 14. Joshua entered into this agreement with the people and he did not consult with the Lord first. Maybe it felt like the right thing to do. Maybe in his heart it felt like the right thing to do. But he made a terrible mistake that would harm the nation of Israel for generations to come. We've got to be so careful. We need to understand that we are totally depraved and the only way that we can get it right is through the leadership of the Lord and the guidance of the Word of God and of the Holy Spirit. Remember that book that was written back in the 60s, late 60s, I'm Okay and You're Okay, by Dr. Thomas A. Harris. It was reprinted later in 1972, stayed on the New York Times bestseller list for two whole years. The basic idea in the book, do you, some of y'all remember when that was released? Basic idea is that all humans are essentially good. And those that we call bad are just products of their environment. Now we have these human ideas of goodness and of badness and of what's legal and what's illegal and I understand all of that but when we get right down to the truth of scripture the Bible says that I am not okay and that you are not okay. 
Scripture says in Psalm 51 that all of us were conceived in sin and that every one of us is an object of the wrath of God and left to ourselves. We have a terrible eternity to look forward to. The fact that we are not okay, by the way, is the reason that Jesus Christ had to go to the cross. Liberal teachers, liberal preachers and denominations have been saying to us for years that Jesus essentially just came to set a good example for us. And my goodness, Jesus is the best example of all, but that's not ultimately why Christ came. He sets an, an amazing, wonderful example for us, but Jesus came to this earth to die on the cross, to shed His blood, to make an atonement for our sins. If we were good people, we are righteous people and holy people who did not require repentance, Jesus would not have had to have gone to the cross. But He died for every person because every person is separated from God in need of reconciliation to God. And the only way that can happen is through the blood of our Savior Jesus. That's why a work salvation, by the way, is impossible. And every cult group that you'll find in the United States or all over the world will tell you the way that you are reconciled to God is yes, you must believe in the Lord, but you've got a lot of work to do too. You've got a lot of work to do in order to earn your salvation before the Lord. And I always remind people, you and I cannot do enough good work to be reconciled to God. If we could earn our salvation through good works, why did Jesus have to come? See, here's the problem that we've got. I know we've gotten a little bit deep here tonight, but think about this. You and I have sinned against Jehovah God. That God is eternal. Eternal. That means that when you violate your relationship with the Lord, that you stand in jeopardy of eternal punishment because He's an eternal God. Now that only makes sense. So here's the problem that I've got. If through good works I could reconcile myself to God, I'd have to do an eternal amount of good works and then it still wouldn't be enough. That's why Jesus had to go to the cross because Jesus was fully God and fully man. And being fully man, He is able to redeem fallen human beings. And that is every single one of us. The lie that says, I'm okay and you're okay and what we need to do, we've seen entire denominations start to do this. You know, a few years ago, we put in an application. We, right now, I guess this is timely. The Lord just brought this into my remembrance. Have you heard people wishing everybody a happy Pride Month right now? Happy Pride Month. That's what they say that June is, Pride Month. I'll never forget it was on June 26, 2015 when the highest court in this land said that it was fine now for homosexuals to be granted marriage rights to be able to marry one another. For the first time in United States history, we said that somebody, some, some union of, of, of something other than a man and a woman for life is what we consider to be marriage. And so you hear people going around right now talking about happy pride this and pride that. You can't hardly walk into a department store or scroll through a social media without being bombarded with some of those images and messages. You know, a few years ago, we put in an application with the, the group that's actually called locally Knox Pride. We put in an application to go and to share a witness down outside of the Civic Auditorium in Knoxville. And here's what I, I told the lady, the person that I spoke with, they were surprised that we wanted to do it. They said, do you agree with the homosexual lifestyle? I said, no, we don't. We're adamantly opposed to it. We think it's an abomination to God. They said, then why do you want to be down here? We said, because God loves every single person that's going to be down there. And we love every single person that's going to be down there. And here's what we want to do. We, we want to hand out bottles of water in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And with every single one of them, we'd like to give out John 3.16 tracks and bracelets. They, I think, reluctantly, I guess, granted our application... We went down the first year that we went down. We had some people who tried to confront us and start arguments with us. Some of you were there probably, I think, when that happened. We handed out water. We handed out tracks. I estimate that we handed out about 2,500 tracks that first year that we went down. We had a great experience. I felt so good about it because I knew that we had, we had tried to witness to folks right on the front lines in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The second year came, I could not be with the team that day. I think I was out of town at that time. And so my brother Anthony helped to uh, lead 
that team that evening was doing a great job with our folks that afternoon. Uh, they were about halfway through the day. Somebody came up to them, confronted them, tried to start a confrontation. Our, our people tried to de-escalate the situation and just love them and try to encourage them and the Lord. And they just were not going to have it. When they found out that we were there, that we did not affirm their lifestyle, they just threw a huge fit. And the organizer said that our team of people would have to go. I'll never forget that my brother Anthony said some officers came to try and help escort them out and get them out of the, the courtyard, the assembly area where all the, the teams and the, the people were set up. And the officers actually said to our team, it breaks our heart that we have to escort you out of here and you have to leave because we need more people like you down here sharing the love of God, the truth of God with the folks that are down here. Here's the point I was trying to get to with that story. I wasn't there the second year, but I was there the first year. And they had a long row of tents set up. And what you had to do is you actually had to rent space in the assembly in order to have a place to hand out water or tracks or to do whatever you were going to do. There was probably about a dozen churches there in that line of churches that they placed us in. They called us church row. They placed us on the very end of the row. We were on the end. There was about 11 or 12 other churches beside us. Of all of the churches that were there at the Pride Fest, we were the only ones that stood against the lifestyle of homosexuality. People in places that claim to be churches were affirming of the lifestyle. You know what they were essentially saying? You folks don't need to repent. And guess what? We don't need to repent. God loves us just like we are. We can live how we want to live. We can be who we want to be. That is the doctrine of Satan himself. And if you and I believe that, he will use that to send us down into hell one of these days. The gospel says, I am a sinner in desperate need of Jesus. He's the only hope I have. And I believe that Christ died for my sins according to the scripture. Now I want to be born again. I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. That's the gospel we'll continue to preach. Until the Lord Jesus calls us back, some people won't like it, some people will hate it. We're going to continue to love them and, and share Jesus anyway. Number three, a fool believes that there is no judgment for sin. Verses four through six says, Have all the workers of iniquity have no knowledge who do not call on the name of the Lord? They assault my people. They look down on the poor. A paraphrase of what the Lord is saying there is, If you really believe that I judge sinful people, then you wouldn't mistreat my people. You would live in holiness. You would live in righteousness. But there are some people who tend to believe that there is no judgment for sin. I've already shared with you a story from the late 70s or a song from the late 70s and early 80s. Let me give you another 70s song. Remember this song by John Lennon called Imagine released on October 11, 1971? First verse says, Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. That's the world that John Lennon imagined. That's not the world imagined by our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the ramblings of a foolish man. The Bible clearly says in Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed to man once to die and after that the judgment. Paul said we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. What that is to, to say to us is that there is coming a day and a time where we will have to give an account for God for the way that we lived our lives. Did we place our faith in Jesus Christ? And if we did, what did we do with Christ? Did we make disciples? Did we live in obedience to God? Did we try to serve the needs of other people? The Lord Jesus will hold us accountable for all of that. There was a time when the scripture says that Israel acted like a bunch of fools. In Judges, it's the statement is made several times. Each man did what was right in his own eyes. I submit to you that did not work out so well for the nation of Israel. And that will not work out for us as well. Why is that? Because the Bible says in Numbers 32, verse 23, Beware, for your sin will find you out. There will be a reckoning. Sometimes our reckoning happens down here in this world. The Lord, you know, there can be consequences for our sin. 
There will be times if we're followers of Christ and we thank the Lord when we step out of the way, God loves us enough as a heavenly father to correct us and discipline us and put us back in the right path. Thank God that he loves us enough to correct us. Sometimes people say, though, why does it seem like ungodly, wicked people who hate other people and love violence and do ungodliness, why does it seem like they're so blessed? Seems like they never have a problem and they never have an issue. And then you see righteous people who love the Lord and they're sold out to Christ. And they have terrible tragedies happen in their life. Well, you know, part of that answer is that you and I live in a fallen world. Sin, disease, tragedy, calamity, all of that is just part of the human experience. And until the Lord Jesus Christ makes all things new, we're going to continue to have tragedy. We're going to lose loved ones. We're going to be diagnosed with disease. But you know, it's the devil who whispers in our ear though and says, you serving God doesn't do a bit of good for you. What has God done for you? Look at how that man over there is being blessed. And he hates God. Look how rich he is. Look how blessed she is. Look how beautiful she is. Look how much influence she has. That's the devil whispering in our ear. Take this into account. You may suffer for Christ for the rest of your life. But the Lord Jesus Christ knows everything that you've suffered for His glory. You keep living for Him until the Lord Jesus Christ calls you home. All those folks that have spent their life blaspheming the name of God and working against the gospel of Christ, one of these days, every single one of them, every person in the world will have to kneel down at the feet of Jesus and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is coming a day and a time where all the world will recognize the Lordship of Christ. May God help all of us to keep living for His glory because there is judgment for sin. There is a reckoning at the end of time. And then fourth and finally tonight, let me say this to you. Only a foolish person would believe that God is finished with the people of Israel. Verse 7 says, When the Lord brings back the captivity of His people, when you read verse 7 there in Psalm 14, you you read these messianic and, and end times Words, things that God is saying about His people. They'll be in captivity, but God will bring them back and God has a plan for His people, Israel. You know, there are some people in the world that you can read these books of theology and things, and there are some people who believe that the church, you and I are a part of the church, right? Bought by the blood of Christ, adopted into the family of God. The Lord is our heavenly Father. We are a part of the church. We're the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. There are some people who teach, and this is a dangerous doctrine of the devil, I believe, that the church has replaced Israel as the people of God. That is a dangerous, unbiblical doctrine. The people who believe that are called replacement theologians. They say the church has replaced Israel. Just a cursory reading of the Bible should show us that God still has a plan for His people, Israel. Let me give you some verses here for a moment. Romans chapter 11 verses 25 through 26 says, When the fullness of the Gentiles have come in, when all the Gentiles who I believe are going to be spared and saved by God Himself, and He knows all about that, when that time has come, Scripture says in Romans eleven twenty six, 26, All Israel will be saved. What an amazing, awesome time That's going to be, I hope I live long enough to begin to see some of that. Revelation chapter 7, the Bible says there, 144,000 Jews are going to be spared out of the great tribulation, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And they will be witnesses to Christ, Jewish people. We think of the Jews right now and we think, man, they they don't believe in Christ. You know, if you go to Israel... I've been instructed when you go to Israel and you're a fo- we're followers of Jesus, we gladly bear the name of Jesus Christ. But the problem that the Jewish people have is that a lot of terrible, horrible, ungodly things have been done to them in the name of Jesus Christ. So when you go to Israel and you deal with Jewish people, they've told us routinely, don't tell them you're Christians. Now, we don't want to hide that. We're not ashamed of that. They say instead, tell them that you're Baptist. You know what they'll say? What is that? 
And then you can start to share Jesus with them. You can start to share the gospel with them. All that to say that terrible things have been done to the Jews, but we know that in the end of time, Jewish people are going to stand up and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. All the way till you come to Revelation 21 and 22, the Bible says there'll be a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. You know what that tells me? Jerusalem is the center of God's universe. I thank God we had a president in this country that was willing to say that Jerusalem is the eternal capital of Israel. Thank God for that. And we better stand with the people of Israel. God has given His word to Israel, an everlasting covenant. If God is finished with Israel, listen to this. People say God has replaced Israel. His covenant with Israel has been discontinued. Well, if God would discontinue His covenant with the nation of Israel and forget them in the end of time, though the Bible says that clearly He's not going to do that, but if He would neglect and negate His covenant with Israel, what would lead you and I to believe that God would keep His covenant of salvation with you? Do you and I want God to negate His covenant of salvation with us? I certainly don't. Well, he's, and He's told us in His Word that I've saved you eternally. In fact, you know what the Bible says in Romans chapter 11, verse 29? That the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. That ought to make even a Baptist shout. Romans chapter 11, verse 29. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Let me ask you, is salvation a gift? Yes, it's the greatest gift of all. Is salvation a calling? Yes, it's the effectual calling of God to receive the gift of grace. God says the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. If you have received the gift of God's grace, you can never lose it because it's an irrevocable gift given to us by God. And if God has made His covenant with the nation of Israel, if it's a gift, if it's a calling, it is eternally secure. We are Jews, we are Gentiles, but all of us fall under the Lordship of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we rejoice in that. We know that God is not done with His people, Israel. Some of you all have tried to witness to people at your workplace. Because you might say, what is all this about tonight? What are you telling us this for? Some of you all have dealt with people in your workplace who say they're atheist, they're agnostic, they're very hard to reach, very hard to witness to. I want to give you this, and this is going to sound kind of severe coming from our Savior Jesus, but hear me out. Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, Jesus said, Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast pearls before swine. What does that mean? I think what it means in context, Jesus was saying, if somebody is not ready, if they're not prepared to hear the fullness of the truth of the gospel or various other things that God has revealed to us, sometimes we prematurely share things with people that they may not be ready for. Now, was Jesus trying to say there that the gospel should be withheld from foolish people? Absolutely not. But rather, instead, I think Jesus was trying to say to us that it shouldn't be forced on those who are unready or unwilling to receive the gospel. In other words, we must use some discernment. Now, to try and help you understand what it is that I'm trying to explain right now, I want to close with these words. I, I first penned this little ditty, I guess, about 12 years ago. I want to share it with you now. I call this witnessing to an atheist. Think about this for just a moment. Witnessing to an atheist. You ever tried to do that before, by the way? Any, raise your hand if you've ever tried to witness to an atheist. Okay. Thank God that you tried. Keep on trying. Witnessing to an atheist is like nailing jello to the wall. You ever done that before? How do you reason with someone who leaves no room for God at all? I've tried a number of approaches and had several deep conversations. Countless hours have been expended mulling over some heavy observations. I've presented various arguments that demonstrate God's existence. Yes, most haven't been persuaded despite my passion and persistence. I've considered their hypotheses, though most of them are odd. Uh, I do understand why the scripture says the fool has said there is no God. Though they're foolish in their thinking, one thing is sure. God sent Christ to save them, and sharing Jesus is what we must do. So when you witness to an atheist, there's no need for strife. Remember, there's no counter-argument to a loving spirit. 
and a changed life. You know what's really going to reach the atheist around us? When they see that we are people of love and joy and peace and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness and mercy and self-control and all the fruit of the Spirit, when people see that you have been changed, and by the way, those atheists who don't agree with you are watching you. They're watching you. They listen to the language you use. They look at the things that you look at on your phone. The social media that you take the time to look at, maybe on a break in the job. They hear your conversation with other people in the office, on the, on the job. And those atheists are looking at you. Because, you know, the Bible says that there are occasions, there are times when people really are seeking after truth. Remember when there was a eunuch that was traveling from Ethiopia to Jerusalem? And the Bible says that Philip came to his chariot. When he got to the chariot of the Ethiopian eunuch, he was reading the Scripture. And he was reading the Scripture in the place where it says in Isaiah chapter 53 that he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. This, this Ethiopian eunuch, by the providence of God, when Philip walked up, just happened to be reading probably the most Christ-centered passage in all of the Old Testament. And so when Philip gets there, of course he shares Jesus with him. The eunuch falls under conviction, places his faith in Christ. They get to some water and the eunuch says, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? He says, if you believe in the Lord Jesus with all your heart, you may. And he steps down off to the chariot. He's baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But all that to say that the eunuch was searching for truth. He was searching for God. There are people around you who will tell you they're atheist. They're agnostic. They have no use for the church. They have no use for pastors. They have no use for Christians. They think all believers are hypocrites. There are people around you that will tell you all of that. But what they will not admit to you, what they will not tell you, is that they really are searching. And they really are hurting. And what I'm saying to you is that when the opportunity presents itself, you and I should take every opportunity that we have to try and lead people to Christ. I understand, yes, Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine. There are some things, there are some truths that some people aren't ready for yet. We, we need to use discernment in that. Remember the Apostle Paul said even in the church, I wanted to give you guys meat, but you weren't ready for it yet. So he says, I've had to continue to feed you all milk because you're not ready for the deeper, harder truths yet. There are some people around you who are not ready for the depths of everything that you know about Christ. But every person around you, though, does need to hear the gospel. And in the best way that we know how, we've got to do everything that we can to try and reach people with the gospel of Christ. Keep this in mind. Let this encourage you before we pray. All those people around you who say that they're atheists, all those people who say they're agnostic or something else, in the depths of their heart and their soul, they really don't believe that. According to the word of God, they really do know the truth in the depths of their spirit being made in the image of God. They know that's not right. But they're living in rebellion against God. Pray for those people. Love those people. Model Jesus to those people. And as those opportunities present themselves, share Jesus with them. Share the gospel with them.